Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Michael Moss. Michael is a journalist and an author. He has reported for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. He has also been an adjunct professor at the Columbia School of Journalism, and he is the best-selling author of the book, Salt, Sugar, Fat. And today, we will speak about his latest book, Hook, Food, Free Will, and How the Food Giants Exploit Our Addiction. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, and thank you so much for your work. <laughs> Michael, uh, so we have a lot of room to cover, but I, I would like to know a little bit about your background. You are into journalism, you are writing books, you are a prize winner for your uh, Pusler, prize winner for your writing. How do you get into this world? Um, I had a high school teacher who taught a journalism class. And one day I came back and she said, hey, Michael, I think you have a knack for this. <clears throat> and I went to a very competitive school and it was kind of the nicest thing any of my teachers ever said about me. And then she told me that in journalism, you could make a living. People would pay you to wander around and ask questions and learn things. <clears throat> And I thought that was just about like the coolest thing I ever heard. <clears throat> so I've pretty much been a journalist all my life. I started at really tiny newspapers. And as you mentioned, I worked for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and I now write about books. Um, the only other thing to kind of add is that back in 2008, I was actually writing about something entirely different from food. I was writing about the failure of the Pentagon to equip soldiers with armor in Iraq, and then writing critically about the war on terrorism. When I got in some trouble and I had to come back to the United States really quickly, and one of my editors suggested that I look at this incident of contamination involving peanuts that were being manufactured as ingredients for the processed food industry. And I took a look at, at that and I was just absolutely stunned because it was like going from one war to another because so many people in the United States and now globally are having health trouble because of their increasing dependence on these ultra processed foods that I thought that this was a subject that I could really spend some time with to get to, to know and understand. I wonder when you were a young man and your professor told you that you had a knack for this, uh, meaning journalism, what was exactly that knack? You know, that's a really good question. I'd written a story <clears throat> about a protest on the campus where we were, or actually on the university campus that was near my high school. And I think that the story worked because I was curious and I was able to listen to people quote them accurately and 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 write a story that kind of summarized the situation which is which is kind of the heart of journalism being curious about something digging into it a little bit being fair and honest in your reporting listening to people but also being able to kind of put it in in a broader context of what's going on so so I think I did a few of those things. And, and journalism can also be kind of instinctual. Um, they talk about having a nose for news, mm -hmm. kind of just getting a feeling for where the story is and how it's going and what the deeper currents are in the news. And I, and I think I might have been born with those instincts. Okay, one more question about journalism. I wonder what's your opinion about the future of journalism when we have to consider artificial intelligence and people competing in the internet for click bites and this and google practically taking over the whole sphere of journalism yeah i left the new york times to write books at a time when the paper was failing financially then trump got elected and suddenly the new york times was doing fabulously financially because people saw it as the anti-Trump. Um, whether they can continue that success is hard to know, but 
But despite the, the New York Times is sort of financial success, the, the story of journalism in this country <clears throat> is incredibly sad. So many of my peers have lost their jobs because so many news organizations have folded shop because people don't advertise, <clears throat> companies don't advertise the way they used to. And, and, and people haven't been as willing to buy their news, to pay for the news, which is so expensive to produce as 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 we would hope so so i think the whole industry is facing and you know continued financial pressures it's really tough being a young journalist today um and i'm you know i'm optimistic certainly that the bigger news organizations can continue but but even they're under pressure from the way consumers <clears throat> have changed their media habits and as you mentioned you know we get we get information and quote unquote facts now from all kinds of places, which is often problematic from a standpoint of, of making good decisions about the world when decision making as just citizens and voting is, is has never been more important than it is now. Um, one last question about this. I have heard about experienced journalists uh, creating their own newsletters, pay newsletter, and some of them seems to be doing okay. Is this just the one percent, or is this something that other journalists can get into? Yeah, I've heard of that too. Um, I'm not sure the extent to which um, anybody could sort of replicate that. It may just be journalists who already have a name for themselves. Mm who are coming from like a big organization and so they can sort of play off of that to some extent. I'm, I'm, I'm just not familiar with it, but it, but it is pretty interesting. There certainly are some journalists who are, who are building, you know, audiences and a subscriber list and seem to be able to make some money reporting. Whether that's sustainable or not is hard to say too. Journalism is really hard. It's when you've done right, it's super time consuming. And so I wonder even if those journalists without an organization behind them can, can kind of keep up that pace and that energy level to sustain that kind of a business pro, uh, model. Okay, well, now let's go back to the subject of your, uh, or your book. I had to tell you that I have a close friend who read your book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, and he transformed his body from someone who was a little bit on the chubby side to now he's a fitness instructor. And he said that the great part of the transformation of his body was uh, thanks to your book. So can you just tell us two or three words about your book? Yeah, so Salt Sugar Fat was, is an expose of that cartel we call the, the processed food industry. 10 companies dominate increasingly the eating habits of the world by engineering their products using extraordinary science um, from the ingredients to the marketing of those products um, in ways that get us not just to like them, but to want more and more of them. And with salt, sugar, fat, I was incredibly lucky to come across a mountain of internal documents, mm -hmm. emails and memos and white papers that took me inside these biggest companies as they were formulating, engineering, marketing, positioning their products. And it was those documents that enabled me to meet key insiders in those companies who opened up revealed even more secrets and the overall sense of what you get from those documents and those interviews is is an industry that's driving day and night to get us hooked on their products right okay so your book uh focus mostly on the industry and the chemicals and the marketing and this and that uh, but um well <laughs> i i'm just gonna tell you that take one second to talk about my cultural background. I come from Colombia, a poor country. And in my culture, one way that a family can display wealth other than having a fancy watch or a nice car on the garage is by showing how fat their kids 
are. So oh boy. My, my, I remember my father wanted to display that he was doing well financially. And I remember being forced to eat. And well, that stayed in my mind for almost all my life. And I was addicted to food. I was always, almost always fat. And it was a cultural scene as opposed to a, um, a industry of the fat food uh, conglomerate. I wonder if you have any insights on the cultural overeating side of things. Oh, no, absolutely. And, and I take it that's probably changed to some extent, right? At it least has, kind of has, with the yes. middle class and right, where, where now obesity is like a major health concern and not something to be sort of proud of in terms of having your kids. I mean, that story is so compelling though, because as I learned with Hooked, you know, underlying salt, sugar, fat, ingredients, marketing, are these basic instincts we have to eat and maybe even historically to overeat when we could, because that used to be such a good thing. Um, and the companies have figured out ways to exploit um, those basic instincts on our part to overeat. And one of the things that can be used against us is our childhood experience with food. I mean, what we eat and how much we eat as children forms memories in our brain that don't disappear, forms body fat that doesn't disappear even when the body fat shrinks. It's always with us, always waiting for the opportunity to sort of get full again, depending on, you know, from what we're, from what we're eating. So, so I think one of the revelations for me in the reporting for the newest book was just how deeply the companies have gone into our brains, into our biology, to create foods that destroy free will mm. on our part. And a child who's been raised to be obese intentionally is going to have an incredibly hard time shaking that as they, as they become adults. Yes, I have to tell you, I had a, I had a incredible hard time getting rid of my obesity. But on the subject of free will, Aren't we uh, designed to crave all these sugars and fat? I mean, when we were hunter gatherers, that's the one thing that our brain was designed for to reproduce and to be always looking to the most, I guess, efficient uh, calories that we could get at that moment. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's one of the things that really startled me <clears throat> in doing the research for Hooked was the, the role of evolutionary biology in our biology and our brains. Um, we by nature came to love food that's inexpensive because that meant less energy expenditure on our part. And if you're in a hunter-gatherer society, expending less energy means you can use that energy for other things like having more babies, which is kind of what evolution is all about. Um, we love by instinct food that's highly variable um, because it enabled us to move around the world and get excited about things like whale blubber if you're living in the Arctic and that's what you have to eat, right? So became, we became really attracted to different kinds of food. Of course, the food industry uses that, exploits that, and that's why when you walk into the cereal aisle, of a certainly of an American grocery store, if not a Colombian grocery store, you'll get as many as 200 versions of sweet breakfast cereal because that diversity, that, 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 that variety is something that excites our brain. And then as you mentioned calories, we by instinct love food that has lots of calories. I mean, we have sensors in the tongue, possibly the gut, that tell us how many calories there are and things that we're eating and drinking, something I didn't know, it's incredible. Um, and the brain gets more excited by things that have more calories. And so what did the food industry do? They created this, these energy dense, highly caloric products that don't have a lot of nutrition, but they get us excited and they get us wanting more of those products 
because they're jam packed with calories, which instinctually our whole body is telling us that we want and want more of. Okay, but this require, of course, these scientists who are trying to get into our brains and these marketing departments, this on that, that requires a lot of capital. That uh, that guides me to the idea that there is a huge profit uh, behind these companies. And also, um, I taught myself to like broccoli, for example, but I have never heard of a broccoli cartel the carrot <laughs> cartel, you know, I just right, hear of right. this, of this right. industry that have all these chemicals that would make us addicted to, to their products. Right. So broccoli is like a commodity where lots of different farmers mm. grow it. And it's one of the reasons why you never see advertising or marketing for broccoli, because it's really hard for one farmer to be willing to put some money into a pot to sell something that maybe is produced by his competitor down the road or another farm. You know what I mean? It's not a brand. These processed food products that we're talking about are brands. Um, and so the companies are perfectly willing, it's logical for them to put, you know, millions and millions of dollars into advertising their brand, their right. product, because only they make it. And that's one of the biggest problems in the food system is when you walk in the grocery store, most of the marketing, um, most of the advertising is going toward those ultra processed foods and not the things we should be eating more of, according to nutritionists, broccoli and vegetables and whole fruits and nuts and, and, and those things, which get almost almost no marketing. So they're they're not in our heads, in our emotions, the way that processed foods are. Okay, well, you have taken the time to research and write this book and to illuminate us, you know, uh, about what's going on with the foods that we eat. And I wish you a lot of success, but uh, not to be pessimistic, you are no match in marketed power against, uh, I don't know, <laughs> Philip Morris or I, I, I forgot Altira, I forgot the name of the company. Uh, so where are we going? Are we, are we going to continue being victims of these food companies or is there going to be eventually an awakening and people are going to begin to realize how dangerous these foods are for them? Right. And before I answer that question, I see my screen is frozen. Yes. Are you, yes. is that, it's that's frozen. just on my end? It's fine. No, it's frozen, but that's okay. It's frozen. Yeah. Are you sure? Should I figure out what's going on? No, no, no. That's okay. You don't care. Okay. Um, so yeah, absolutely. These, these companies, and there's about 10 of them that dominate the processed food world are so powerful with so much money to lobby government officials to market and advertise to influence what we value in food that there are times when I'm totally pessimistic about our ability to sort of change. That said though, increasingly there are more and more people who care about what they're putting in their bodies and they're doing things to change how they value food. They're paying more attention to what they eat. They're finding ways to cook meals from scratch in ways that isn't too expensive or too time consuming. Um, they're teaching kids about the value in eating better foods. And so part of me is incredibly optimistic about our ability to kind of reclaim what the food companies took for us. And the biggest thing they stole from us was, was sort of how we value food, whether it's what they want us to think, which is immediate gratification, taste, the sensation of eating, or whether it's what more and more of us are wanting, which is to see food as fuel for our bodies and fuel for our brains and, and the foundations of good health uh, th for the rest of our life and strength. Um, so, so I think it's, a, it's, it, it's going to be this sort of contest of wills between us and the companies going, going forward. Right. But there are also many other factors, other, uh, for example, uh, everyone knows 
up to that point, I assume or I believe that cigarettes are bad for you. And I believe that almost everyone knows that eating a salad is better than eating a bag of Oreo cookies. Yet, I guess because of our addictions, in spite of our knowledge, we still reach out for that bag of cookies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's been one of the hardest things for like, say, attorneys who've mm. been wanting to take these food companies to court and hold them responsible for having ruined the health of so many people contributed to that certainly um the trouble is that that a jury of people looking at food don't see it as cigarettes i think we still want to believe that food even oreo cookies and doritos and hot pockets and lunchables that all food or soda all food is inherently good um and it's only maybe you know other factors going into it. and still thinking that personal responsibility and still blaming people for eating and the wrong kinds of food or overeating um so the people and i think a lot of that comes from the marketing you know we've grown up associating their products with cartoon characters and celebrities and and good things and so it's really hard to shake that association and that image we have of their of their products and and, and food generally uh, how about the impact of um, uh, economic disparity in in the industrialized world now uh, a person who is well off is in shape is stream while a person who has less money is on borderline obese so uh, to what attribute uh, to what do you attribute that well because there's this big imbalance in the agriculture system most of the farmland is going toward making soybeans and field corn as key ingredients in ultra processed food um, and very little or much less is going toward fruits and vegetables and nuts. And so that's why you walk into the supermarket and a basket of fresh berries is going to cost as much as a two pound, three meat, four cheese frozen pizza that's going to feed the entire family because everything about these companies everything about the government subsidies, everything about the agriculture system is designed to make that pizza cheaper and cheaper and cheaper um, and thus more attractive to people. So if you're somebody with a really tight budget, what are you going to choose, the berries or the pizza? Of course, you're going to have to go for the pizza. And so people looking to change our relationship to food, the way we value food, are going to have to change the agriculture system as well to make good food, vegetables and fruits and the, the real food more affordable for more people. Wow. Okay, one, one last question. Uh, this one is in regards to lifestyle and many of us are quote unquote workaholic. I used to be a workaholic and instead of sitting down and having a proper meal, I will get a slice of pizza here, a sandwich there. And, you know, I wouldn't have a proper meal, but at the end of the day, I will consume so much calorie. And nowadays that I'm semi-retired, now I have the time to prepare my foods, to see, you know, what's healthy or what's not healthy. So isn't uh, the lifestyle that individuals uh, leave a great contributor as well, in addition to the addictive chemicals in the food, a big contributor to the foods that we eat. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, starting in the 60s in, in North America, certainly, more and more women began working outside of the house. And men didn't take up the slack and start, you know, doing those jobs at home that the women used to have, like cooking meals from scratch that started us down this road of placing a huge amount of value on convenience mm -hmm. on time savers which which sort of created the situation where we became mindless about what we're eating we paid less and less attention to the food we basically said to this cartel trillion dollar cartel we called the processed food industry you take care of our food you know we're going to do some other things 
And of course, the hidden price of that was our health and our over dependence on these on these products. And so when you talk about people changing, wanting to change how they're value food, their situation, they're talking about finding ways to become more mindful about food, paying a little more attention, realizing that for 10 or 15 minutes of the day, they can cook their own meals and be in control of their, regain control of their eating habits and regain control of their of their health. The other day, my, my oldest son just graduated from college. It was yesterday. We were having dinner and he goes, what do you eat for breakfast? And I thought, what a curious question. Because, you know, we wake up at different times in the day. My family, we're doing different things. And we all kind of have our own breakfast. But he coming from college, who just spent like four years kind of not even eating breakfast, just kind of like racing through the day, grabbing whatever he could. But now that he's entering sort of adult working life, something, and I think it was probably one of his friends pointed out to him, you're going to be a lot stronger, healthier, successful, if you can kind of adjust your diet a little bit. So he was looking to figure out, what can I make for myself for breakfast? It doesn't take too much time, but it's going to hold me over until I can get, you know, a good lunch or hold me over until I can get a, you know, a really good dinner down. So it's it's really great to see people start paying a little attention to food and realizing that it's it's not impossible to change your diet, even after a lifetime of bad eating habits. Okay, well, you open the door. What do you eat for breakfast? <laughs> I'm totally stuck these days. And look, you know, it kind of depends if I get my run in. I, I'm, I'm a little addicted to running or doing some kind of exercise in the morning. And so, and sorry about the music, we're in Brooklyn here. It's a beautiful day, there's traffic. Um, after the storm came through last night, actually. Um, so I am totally hooked on a breakfast of blueberries, but I buy frozen blueberries because they're really inexpensive and, and convenient, right? Um, a little bit of yogurt, because I don't know, I just kind of like yogurt, you could use milk or whatever. And then like some kind of, you know, granola on top that I buy at the farmer's market. It's a, it's a pretty wholesome breakfast and it's got like lots of nutrients, a good amount of protein, um, it's crunchy, it's tasty. And what I tend to do is sort of glom onto one thing and stick with that for a while. And then maybe like a month from now, I'll get sick of that and I'll turn to something else. Um, but sometimes I want to eat healthy and not pay a lot of attention to it. So, so I love getting into ruts where I kind of eat the same thing for a while because mm. um, it's time saving, right? I have all the ingredients. I don't have to look up a recipe. Um, so that's where I am. You know, a month from now, I'll have a different answer for you about breakfast, I'm sure. The way I beat obesity was to always eat the same thing, except when I go out with friends to restaurant and then I experiment on something new. Well, oh, that's Michael so interesting. Uh, Michael, I know one one group of people who are not going to like your book, which is the food industry. They are they're probably going to hate it. But for the rest of us, can you tell us one more time the title of the book and where they can follow you? Oh, sure. The latest book is called Hooked, Food, Free Will, and How the Food Giants Exploited Our Addictions. Your local bookseller, Hopefully we'll have it. I love independent bookstores. You can always go to online stores like Amazon to find it as well. Michael, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me.